cards how many minutes you have left. Um, but you know, we've, got, we've got six presentations to go through, so I'm going to jump right in. Um, our first speaker is Diane Burbank. She has served as the ecologist for the Green Mountain and Finger Lakes National Forest in Vermont and New York since 1992. She provides forest ecology expertise for planning and analysis of landscape management projects, manages the forest special areas program, and oversees the reinvention of the forest ecological site classification and mapping efforts. Diane received her BS in forestry from UVM in 1984, and her MS in forest ecology from Michigan State University in 1991. Her talk is Long-Term Monitoring Plots on the Green Mountain National Forest. Thank you. I feel like, yeah. All right. If I step away from the mic, can you hear me, or do we really need the mic? Okay. All right. Um, so this is actually a status report or an update because about five years ago we talked about long-term ecosystem monitoring um, here at VMC. Um, and we have not established any of those plots yet. So I'll give you a little background and um, then we'll jump into what we have. So uh, our, our objective with our long-term monitoring plots was to establish a set of plots across a wide range of ecosystems on the forest to establish a baseline for monitoring long-term effects of broad-scale environmental changes. We imagine these plots as a, a set of 50-year plots. We'd monitor them at 10-year intervals. We had originally hoped to put in 40, but we ended up getting 20 in. Um, and our objectives for what um, the Forest Service would establish at the beginning were um, some soil sampling, vegetation liking, lichen, and down debris. We did this work. Um, our primary partners were the Northern Research Station and the National Resource Conservation Service. Um, they contributed um, to our work and they did some of the work themselves. We had um, the Vermont, Vermont Youth Conservation Corps, which also did a lot of the grunt work. They, did, they dug all the soil pits, um, so they were really invaluable. <laughs> and we collaborated on this effort in the developing and the planning of it with the Vermont Monument Cooperative and with uh, Forest Parks and Recreation. When we wanted to identify the kinds of sites uh, that where we wanted to establish these plots. Uh, we identified dominant natural communities, dominant soil series that we wanted to establish them in. On our forest, we have what we informally call our reference area network, which are a series of management areas where we don't do commercial timber harvesting. Um, they're, it's really not intensive management, so we manage you know, wilderness, um, special areas, those sorts of places. That's where we want to focus establishment of these plots. We wanted them to be not very close to roads and trails. We wanted no signs of recent disturbance, 80 or more years old if we could find them, um, and be able to um, look at a range of aspects and elevations. So, I'm going to step away from my minute. So, with um, Uh, 
elevation distribution, as you can see uh, on this slide, um, from really low elevations where we have open ribbon hardwoods, all the way up to um, off the top of Mount A in a montane fir forest. So our sampling design for these plots started out um, with the FIA. Um, we adopted phase two and three plot protocols for vegetation, structure, for diversity, for trees, saplings, downwoody debris, um, and also for lichen as well. As you can see at the bottom, in this section here, uh, we developed, we used the soil sampling design that was based on the Vermont Monitoring Cooperative's uh, long-term soil monitoring protocols, and so we establish a grid of uh, soil pits and select three three blocks in one in each of those grids for the first for each sample that we do every 10 years. And then the lichen sampling was modified to accommodate the soil sampling. So what did we do? We established 20 sets of plots over the years from 2008 to 2011, five plots a year. We were pretty successful in getting our soil and veg diversity sampling collected on all 20 of the plots. Um, we have data on our other objectives, tree saplings, downwood material, and lichen sampling on some of the plots, but less than half of them. And that was a real challenge getting that work done. All of our plots are permanently monumented because a lot of them are in the wilderness. They're not monumented in the sense of having flagging or and anything really obvious on the surface. But we do have um, our, the monuments are metal. They're sunk down, um, not into the ground, but near the soil surface. And uh, we believe with metal detectors and other um, really good geographic data that we'll be able to relocate these plots. We collected a ton of soil samples, dried and shipped them off to Harvard Burke for chemical analysis. Um, and we have all of our data that um, was gathered on vegetation and such in spreadsheets and on paper. So just a little overview of what we found, what we have at our plots, because um, this is our baseline, so there's not no earth shattering science here. It's just this is what we have to start with. Um, we're in hogback and mundus soils. We're in the most frequently encountered soils at our plots. Um, there's 60 pits in each across the 20 plots. A quarter of those pits did, out, did not actually fit well with existing soil series descriptions. So these associated soil series, some of them are dead on and some of them are approximations. Um, Tom Villers, who many of you know, um, did all of the soil horizon uh, descriptions for all of the plots and he prepared soil reports for most of our plots. And then um, the Hubbard analyses just came in two days ago. <laughs> um, I have a spreadsheet now, um, so I wasn't able to include it in the slide. For vegetation, as you can see, most of the plots are on northern hardwoods. That's uh, this color here. 55% um, of them. We have a nice wide range, though, of natural communities. So, you know, we, the larger wedges are two plots each, and the smaller ones are one plot each. You know, we have all the way from red oak and red oak northern hardwoods, hemlock northern hardwoods, up to you know montane spruce fir, montane yellow fir, red spruce, and uh, Montane fir. So um, sugar maple was the most dominant species in terms of canopy cover. We do have that information. Uh, in terms of anything notable on the plots, um, in terms of disease or issues, uh, beach bark disease is the one thing that was pretty apparent on many of our hardwood plots um, was beach decline was happening. Um, our, as I mentioned, we're missing a number of plots for tree and sapling and downwood material data. And our vegetation data is not summarized. It's sitting on um, paper forms of relevant. So when we're looking ahead, we did this first round of sampling starting in 2008. So 2018 would be the 10-year anniversary, and that's when we'd start sampling again. Um, so we are starting to look at lessons learned, challenges from that exercise. and. Um, I just want to point out a few things that we learned. For instance, um, we thought the collaboration with um, all the participants in the project were valuable, particularly the Vermont Youth Conservation Corps, um, because without them, I mean, they had to dig three pits at each plot. Um, so 60 pits, that's a lot of work. 
Um, they're young, they have a lot of energy, they kind of scramble up those hills, and all of us are <laughs> aging. And so they're really important. Um, we did have some safety issues with them, so we, uh, um, we need to keep that in mind. Um, Schedule coordination was really challenging. That's why a lot of our data, we weren't able to collect a lot of data on the, on the um, trees, the saplings. Um, we are challenged by analysis and summary of the data. We have the data on forms. We thought it was challenging to collect the data. We found it's even more challenging to analyze and summarize the data. It's sitting in folders, and we haven't made a lot of um, effort beyond that to, to turn it into usable data. And then we had some other analyses, tree ring and foliar analyses that we were hoping to do that we never got funding to be able to make those happen. Um, so the next steps we've identified for the project is to continue to re, uh, retain, maintain the partnerships that we have. We need to solve the data storage and sample storage issues that we have, develop a funding strategy for 2018, and then we need to make decide how we're going to deal with our missing data. Do we, you know, just give up and move on to the next round and figure out a new strategy? Do we try to gather the data that's missing between now and 2018? Um, we have to solve that problem as well. And I'll just leave you with this, that, you know, that this is sort of the, the basis of why we're doing this. We want to quantify these trends to help us do adaptive management, um, to contribute to larger databases, and to contribute to overall science in making better land management decisions. Thank you. 